welcome. I wanna ask a few questions to start us off. First of all, why are we here? Why is creating a gender inclusive culture so important? Why did we do this event today? How can all of us support the non-binary people in our lives? What does it mean to create a welcoming and safe space in our workplaces? And how do we even begin to talk about these issues? Because sometimes it's hard. So to help us start this conversation, we brought together three outstanding panelists to help understand the language of gender diversity and inclusion and to offer their experiences, strategies, and tools for creating a more gender inclusive workplace and culture. So good morning. Uh, if you have ever been to one of our events before, you already know who I am. I'm Corey Haskell, the Vice President of the University of Southern Maine Foundation. And I'm excited to welcome you, we'll welcome you back to the USM Women in Leadership event, Navigating the Gender Spectrum, Understand, Respect, and Support. So this morning, we're gonna dig into the concept of gender on a broad scale, uh, gain the tools to talk about gender in a more inclusive way, and explore ways to create a welcoming environment for gender diversity, both professionally and personally. Um, the first person we're gonna hear from is a rock star USM alumna. It's Dr. Sarah Holmes. She's the Assistant Provost for Student Affairs at USM. She'll, talk, uh, she'll walk us through the basics on the language around gender diversity. Today's moderator, Ainsley Wallace, will then invite uh, our two other guests, Quinn Gormley, and my 1999 USM poli sci soul sister, Erica Dodge Cates. Uh, they will join the conversation and offer their insights and experience with gender diversity and inclusion work. Um, after our panel, we're gonna dig into your questions about today's conversation. So feel free to drop those questions in the chat at any time during today's event and we'll aggregate them and make sure to um, get them to our moderator. So before we begin, I wanna give you a few um, housekeeping notes. Everyone knows where their bathroom is, so I don't need to do that. Um, I wanna just give a warm welcome. You'll notice that we have um, ASL interpreters with us. So Meryl Troop and Sadie Fishbeck, um, we appreciate you so much and are thankful to have you here. I also want to point out that Sadie is a USM student studying American Sign Language. So welcome, Sadie. Welcome, Meryl. We're glad you're here. Um, this event also has closed captioning available, if that's helpful to you. So you'll notice um, it's on your toolbar. Um, there's a closed captioning li live transcript button. So usually your toolbar is at the bottom of your screen or it's at the very top. Just go to the live transcript button um, and click the arrow to the right and you'll turn on your closed captioning. Um, second thing I wanna say is just uh, please remain muted during the panelist conversation. Um, if you are not here to respect, listen, support, learn, today is not your day. So let me be clear. Um, so thanks for um, being here and being um, a good ally. So if you, again, if you have a question for our panelists, uh, submit those questions via the chat. We're gonna monitor that uh, throughout our morning. So a pro tip for optimal viewing, use the Zoom speaker view. You can find it by clicking the view button um, on your toolbar and by selecting speaker view. Um, you'll also notice that at the bottom of my Hollywood square here, I have my name, Corey Haskell. I have 99, that is my USM grad year. Um, and I also have she, her, her, those are my pronouns. To edit your screen name, select the three dots uh, at the top of your video and select rename. And you can name yourself anything you want today. But I love to see uh, USM alums with their grad years after their names. Uh, so if you wanna show your Husky pride, do that. And also, um, you can start your one activity to be a, a great ally today by putting in your pronouns as well. So I, I um, welcome you to do that. Okay, so as you know, no USM Women in Leadership event is complete without a participant raffle. And we do that whether we have virtual events or in person. Um, so let's start there. Uh, I'd love to ask my team uh, to pull three random attendees for me to read off. And I'm gonna ask my colleague, I think it's Larissa, who's gonna be texting me the names of winners. 
Oh, she's already on it. Thank you, Larissa. So let me welcome my colleague, Blair Schneider, to join the Hollywood Square screen here. She is going to showcase the USM swag that we're going to be raffling off. Oh, there she is. Okay, so Blair, um, first item is a USM scarf, scarf, and Blair is wearing it three ways. Or you can showcase it. Yeah, whatever, whatever's easiest for you, Blair. Beautiful scarf. So um, that scarf will go with a USM Women in Leadership uh, notebook. So the first winner is Denise DeRocher. So you have won the scarf and the USM Women in Leadership notebook. So congratulations, Denise. So the second um, swag, USM swag item is a USM baseball cap with uh, a pride flag as is our value at the University of Southern Maine um, of support and allyship. And also with the um, cap, you will get a USM Women in Leadership notebook. So second winner, Angela Waller. Congratulations, Angela. Um, okay. Third raffle item from Blair is the blue USM water bottle. So you can stay healthy and hydrated. And of course, so you can write down um, all of the things that you're grateful for throughout your day. We'll give you a women in leadership notebook. And the winner is Kimberly O'Donnell. Kimberly O'Donnell. So congratulations to Denise, Angela, and Kimberly. We have your, your contact information um, from your registration form for this event. And so we will um, snail mail you your, your raffle prizes. So congrats again. Um, now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our USM Women in Leadership season sponsor, Bangor Savings Bank. And here with us today is a Bangor Savings Bank relationship manager She's a rising star at the bank, and she's also a 2017 USM alumna. She is a regular at our Women in Leadership events, and um, I'm so glad that we've connected with her. So please welcome uh, Amberlyn Esperanza from Bangor Savings. Good morning, everyone. Amberlyn here. And on behalf of Bangor Savings Bank, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the 2022 Women in Leadership event. Navigating the gender spectrum. Understand, respect, support. Bangor Savings Bank is, a proud to, is proud to sponsor the Women in Leadership series. As a community bank, our promise is to help our employees, customers, and communities thrive and prosper. We are honored to support this important discussion today. As a USM alumni and a major Husky fan, I have always looked forward to USM's Women in Leadership events. This is the time to bring successful women and leaders together to lift one another up and celebrate our successes. Now, happy to turn it back over to Corey. Great. Um, so I'm seeing in the chat that someone has asked um, our interpreter, Meryl, if she is able to um, get more light. Your video is a little bit grainy and blurry. So Meryl, if you're able to um, address that, I'll just throw that out there to you. All right, so thanks for that feedback in the chat, everyone. And, and thank you to Amber Lynn Esperanza and Bangor Savings Bank for being the Women in Leadership season sponsor. And um, just a special shout out to the other BSB team members who have joined us here today. We are grateful to have you as a partner. Okay, so with that, let's get started. It is with great excitement and enthusiasm that I introduce you to Dr. Sarah Holmes. Sarah is the Assistant Provost for Student Affairs and Deputy Title IX Coordinator at the University of Southern Maine. So one of the things that I wanna tell you about Sarah, besides the fact that she is amazing, um, is that she is a rare Triple Crown USM Husky. So what the heck does that mean? That means that she is one of only 15 people in the entire world to earn a bachelor's a master's and a doctoral degree from the University of Southern Maine. So she is a special gem for so many reasons and that is just one of them. Um, this whole event and the topic came to us because Sarah 
um, so graciously uh, uh, offered to come to the University of Southern Maine Foundation and to talk to our staff about gender diversity. And um, we appreciated it. We learned so much and we thought we need to take this to our USM Women in Leadership Affinity Group. So thank you, Sarah. Um, I wanna give you a little bit of background on Sarah. You know, from 2000 to 2002, Sarah was the very first coordinator of USM's LGBTQA Resources Center. Um, in 2002, she was selected as a VAID Research Fellow for the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force Policy Institute in New York City. In 2006, she returned to USM as our coordinator uh, for the Center for Sexualities and Gender Diversity. Today, Sarah is again, USM's Assistant Provost for Student Affairs, and she's our Deputy Title IX Coordinator. She also leads USM's Safe Zone Project, a uh, program to train faculty, staff, and students to be supportive LGBTQ plus allies. So Sarah's gonna share some of the training with us today, including two, tools that will help us all have meaningful conversations about gender and diversity. So Sarah, um, that was a lot, but you deserve it. So welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Take it away. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and, you know, definitely a shout out to my fellow doctoral program cohort uh, members who are here today. I see you. I see you in the chat. Um, so I'm really, really happy to be here and really pleased to be able to continue to do this work um, at USM and in the community. Uh, so I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Let's get this to work. Hopefully you can all see me. I'm going to open up the chat window so I can still see that stuff too. Um, and this here, this is one of the foundational uh, sort of lessons that I often like to use in my trainings. So, so, so often we are still taught that gender looks like the top half of this infographic that there are two options. Uh, they are two, you know, very separate binary options. One is a vaguely purpley blue stick figure, probably wearing pants, maybe, who knows if they're on Zoom. Um, and then the other is, you know, a vaguely pink stick figure wearing either a dress or a superhero cape, depending on your preference. But this is sort of what we're taught, that these are the options and neither the twain shall meet. Maybe we have an understanding that for many people in our community, they may transition from one gender to another, but still this binary persists. So one of the things that we're here to tell you today, if you don't already know that, is that gender really looks more like the bottom half of this infographic. There's a great deal of variety and diversity. Uh, there's a lot of difference. No two people really show their gender identity or their gender expression in the same way. So there's a lot of creativity. There's a lot of difference. And that's one of the things that I think it's really, really important for everyone to remember. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So there are a couple of tools that I, another couple of tools that I like to use. Um, the first one, and this is a little, a little old school. I'll be honest. I've been using this for a long time, but it's evolved over time. They, these are, uh, you know, continuum of sex, gender, and sexuality. Uh, if any of you have ever been in one of my trainings, you have seen this before. Um, but the important thing to know about this, two important things. Uh, the first is that there are four separate categories here. And every single one of us embodies these four different categories in a very different way. Um, the other thing is that because these are on a continuum on a line, it may feel like this is reinforcing that binary, that there are sort of two ends of the line. Um, but really, I want you to think about this maybe more as a circle or a sphere. This is not two end points. This is just, you know, different stops along a journey. Um, which hopefully that'll be the most hokey thing I say all morning. Um, but so the first one, sex assigned at birth, when we are born, uh, you know, a doctor, a midwife, a doula, whoever is attending the birth sort of makes a determination as to what the sex of that child is. Maybe a sonogram technician will tell you before the birth. Um, but this, this assignment of sex is based on, you know, genitalia, might be based on DNA chromosomes, um, might be based on, on other characteristics, but it is a fact that follows us throughout our lives. It goes on our birth certificates, it's on our ID cards, it's, um, you know, it's, it's the box we check off on forms and surveys. But for many people, that male or female designation that is assigned to us 
isn't completely accurate. Uh, and so about one in 1100 babies are born with some type of intersex medical condition. Um, and this is a naturally occurring variation in the species. Um, and fun fact, one in 1100 um, is actually more common than babies born with red hair, right? So this is not an uncommon experience. So even this sort of what we perceive as this immutable legal fact is not always entirely accurate for everyone. Second category, gender identity, is that internal sense of who we are. When we close our eyes and think about who we are deep down inside, what are the words that we use to talk about our gender identity? Boy, girl, man, woman, trans, uh, gender queer, non-binary, uh, gender expansive is sort of an umbrella term we use in the research. Two-spirit for members of our communities who are uh, Native American, Indigenous, two-spirit individuals embody both the masculine and the feminine, um, also the non-binary um, experiences of the world. And so there's lots of different variety. There's lots of words that we use to talk about our gender identity beyond just what we're sort of used to as this man and woman binary. Third category, gender expression. This is how we communicate our gender to the world. This is our, our clothing, how we style our hair, whether or not we wear makeup, what style of jewelry or eyeglasses we wear. It's everything we do to communicate about our gender. And when we, when we see someone for the first time or when we meet someone for the first time or someone is described to us for the first time, we take those elements of gender expression to try to interpret who the individual is and to figure out, well, what pronouns should I use? How should I refer to them? How do I interact with them? And so that gender expression communicates a lot, but it's like all of these individual pieces, not the full story. Um, and again, you know, a lot of times we think about gender expression in terms of masculinity or femininity, um, but you know, androgyny, gender neutral, gender fluid, uh, these are all terms that folks use to talk about their gender expression or to describe their gender expression or their experiences with their gender. It is influenced by culture. It is influenced by region, right? I often say that what femininity in Maine looks like is different from what femininity in the South looks like. Uh, when we think about the women in our communities who are members of the Orthodox Jewish faith who cover their hair with a scarf or a wig, um, women of, you know, from, from Muslim backgrounds who wear a hijab or a niqab or some other head covering, um, men who are of Scottish descent, right, who may choose to wear a kilt as part of their formal wear or even everyday wear. So these are elements of gender expression that are influenced by religion, culture, region, etc. And then the last category here, sexual orientation. To whom are we attracted to? To whom are we engaging in romantic or sexual relationships with? This is where we get terms like gay and lesbian and bisexual, bi meaning two, attracted to either both men and women or attracted to your own gender and another gender. Um, the word pansexual, pan meaning many, being attracted to people regardless of their sex or gender. Um, and also asexual, individuals who don't experience sexual attraction or don't engage in sexual or romantic behavior. Um, you'll see the word queer on here in a few places. We use the word queer to talk about both uh, sexuality and gender in lots of different ways. Queer, of course, has a very storied history. It has a pejorative context for many people. But for many of us, I came out in the early 1990s in a community where the word queer was being used in a political way, in an inclusive way. Um, and so for me, it has a very positive, empowering connotation. And so it's most often the word I use to talk about my own identity. Um, but I think it, it can be a tricky word for some people because it has been used very hurtfully for many. So, so this is our continuum. Some people resonate in a different visual way. And so you may be familiar with the gender unicorn. Um, our friendly little uh, purple cartoon that still embodies this sex assigned at birth, gender identity, gender expression, and then the two hearts, which I really like about this, one representing our physical attraction and one representing our emotional or romantic attraction, which may be one and the same for some people, but is not necessarily the case for everyone. Um, and then this new graphic that I really, really love, this was shared with me by my friend Quinn from the Maine Transgender Network, created by a USM alum, Aiden Threadgood. Um, this, again, much like the gender unicorn, presents another sort of graphic way, visual way of representing these four different categories, right? 
we're talking about the sex we're assigned at birth, our gender identity, our gender expression, and then our orientation to whom we're in relationship with. Um, this is another really great infographic that I borrowed from social media and adapted. What I love about this is it talks about pronouns. So Corey talked about pronouns, indicating your pronouns on your Zoom. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. What I love about this infographic is it provides some options. It also gives an example of how pronouns are used in sentences. We are probably all familiar with she and her, he and him as pronoun sets. We're probably increasingly familiar and comfortable with they and them as a non-binary or gender neutral pronoun set. There are other non-binary sets like Z and here, um, which are used sometimes um, in, in certain contexts and by certain individuals. Um, I hadn't been seeing it for a while, but I have started seeing a resurgence of these other pronoun sets, non-binary pronoun sets. Um, and then individuals using a, a name in place of a pronoun. And so the next time you uh, are introduced to somebody or someone shares with you their pronouns, and they may not be pronouns that you are as used to seeing and using or as comfortable to seeing and using, take some of these sentences and practice them. You'll get a copy of these slides after tonight, this morning's program, but practice them, hand write them. That muscle memory can help, you know, yeah, you know, reprogram your brain to start using pronouns in a different way. Um, type them out if that's the way you use them or practice saying those sentences out loud. Um, these are great ways to sort of get used to using pronouns in a different way. Another exciting thing about pronouns that is important to note is even in languages that traditionally, I'm gonna put traditional in air quotes, traditionally are very gendered where pronouns have a specific gender, um, Spanish, French, Arabic as, as examples, we're seeing the adoption and the integration of non-binary pronouns as well in these languages. And this is really important to note that this is, um, this is a cultural context that's not just happening here in the US, but across the country, across the world, around the world. Um, and, you know, many of us have, have gotten used to seeing Latinx as sort of a non-binary or gender neutral term for, um, for you know, to replace Latina or Latino. Um, and there's a little bit of difference in this. And so what we're seeing in Spanish speaking countries outside of the US is the use of Latine in place of Latinx. And so depending on where individuals are from or how people have been enculturated, you know, they may use Latine or Latinx as a non-binary indicator. So another important element of language is around greeting people. Uh, I know that, you know, when I started off working in customer service and the hospitality industry, being customer service friendly, using, you know, ladies and gentlemen or ma'am or sir was just sort of trained into me. Um, and yet, when we're using those words, we're making an assumption about someone's gender based, again, on those visual cues we get from gender expression or assumptions we're making about someone's gender. And that may not always be accurate. Um, you know, somebody who, you know, in your head, you're categorizing as a lady may not indeed identify as a girl or a woman in any way. And so trying to retrain ourselves to use gender neutral or gender inclusive language. Friends, folks, people, everyone, y'all. Um, you know, there are lots of really great gender neutral and gender inclusive options. And when we're talking about relationships with other people, ask about people's siblings instead of brother or sister. Talk about spouse, partner, significant other instead of husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, et cetera. Um, using the term parent. Um, instead of mother or father, because you never know what someone's you know, situation might be. It's also important to remember that, you know, some folks are growing up in households with, you know, multiple, multiple parents, single parents, uh, grandparents, other family members, foster parents, guardians, other folks at home. So there's lots of ways without using gender to ask or to indicate this, this sort of thing. And the other thing that we're starting to see increasingly is the use of mix, MX, in place of miss or Mr. or Mrs. I do think that we'll start to see this more frequently in the business community. And so it's something I highly recommend as, as an option on forms and letters. Um, Again, it's the use of mix or MX instead of Mr. or Miss. There are lots of best practices. We will talk about some of them as we go through our morning. Um, but you know, some important notes, um, pronouns are super important. I always try to remember to include my pronouns when I introduce myself, when I present myself. 
Um, not because, you know, I'm concerned about what pronouns are used for me, but because I want to signal to other people that I think pronouns are really important. I want to know other people's pronouns. I want to respect other people's pronouns. Um, and I want to make sure that we are including that information. Lots of great information out in the world, amazing social media accounts, blogs, podcasts, websites, organizations, um, you know, where you can go to for information, go to for resources. Um, all gender restrooms are incredibly important. Um, I am, you know, presenting from my home this morning where I have an all gender restroom that anyone of any gender can use. This is important. This is incredibly uh, a, a key way that we can provide safer and more accessible resources in our businesses, our offices, et cetera. Um, you know, when you create name tags, encourage people to put their pronouns on their name tags, the same with our Zoom names, et cetera. Um, if we are doing survey work or if we have forms and applications for people to fill out, make sure that they can authentically indicate their gender. Um, you know, if it is important to know their legal sex, ask for legal sex, but also ask for an individual's gender, because those may be two very different things. Um, if you need to know an individual's legal name, and there are times when we need to know that, absolutely ask for a legal name, but also give people an opportunity to indicate their chosen name or a name that they use other than their legal name. These are, these are just some of the best practices that I think are, are really important to think about um, and happy to talk about more of them as we go along. But I think for now, that is all I'm going to say. I've taken up plenty of time um, and there's lots of other really, really great, uh, great things to talk about and people to, to hear from. So thank you. Thank you. I was just saying, thank you, Sarah. And that reinforced for me actually um, more of the learning that I saw the first time. So it's really good to see it again. Um, so let's pivot and hop into our panel. Before I do that, I do wanna just um, send some shout outs to a, a few folks who have registered for this uh, event. Uh, the Honorable Senator Roger Cates, um, the Honorable State Representative Suzanne Salisbury, um, the Honorable Lee Softley, who is Dean of uh, the UMaine Law School and former Chief Justice of the Maine Law Court, and also uh, the Honorable State Senator Kathy Breen. Um, thank you all for your interest and allyship, and um, we welcome you to USM Women in Leadership. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce today's panel moderator, uh, we like to call her the boss because she is. Uh, welcome to Ainsley Wallace, President and CEO of the USM Foundation. Welcome, Ainsley. Thanks, Corey. And thanks again, everybody, for joining us. And I know that some people were not uh, able to make, a, make it at 7.30 on a Thursday morning, but I wanted you to know that this is the largest registered uh, women in leadership event in our history. We had more than 160 people register. That's one of the reasons why we've recorded this session because we know there's such a deep interest. And Sarah, thank you. I saw in the chat that Libby Bischoff rightly called you a USM treasure. And um, thank you for the work that you've done here now for several decades. Um, and thank you for coming to our staff and producing such good conversation. Um, and uh, as we go into our next part of our conversation, we are going to invite two other panelists to join us today. Erica Dodge Cates, class of 99, and Quinn Gormley. Let me tell you a little bit about them. So uh, Erica Cates is the external communications manager for Hannaford Supermarkets and has led their public relations for the past three years. She's also the chair of Hannaford's LGBTQA plus employee business resource group, Friends. Prior to Erica's work at Hannaford, she was the Vice President of Public Affairs, Marketing, and Development for Central Maine Healthcare. And before that, Erica worked in politics with the Maine Senate Democrats for seven years, and also on various federal, state, and local political campaigns. Welcome, Erica. We're so glad to have you with us. Thank um, you. And, and also, we're uh, excited to welcome future alum, um, Quinn Gormley. Uh, Quinn is the executive director of the Maine Transgender Network, or MTN. Quinn's work with MTN ranges from community building initiatives, expanding health equity and access across the state, suicide prevention, 
policy advocacy and violence prevention. Before MTN, Quinn worked in a variety of community organizing settings, including at the Health Equity Alliance, managing a rural HIV testing program and building rural LGBTQ plus communities and with the Maine People's Alliance working on economic and health justice issues. Uh, so welcome Quinn, we're so honored to have you with us. And, um, and Quinn is wrapping up her uh, courses at USM this semester, which is why we're excited to say that, um, that Quinn is a future alum. So one last thing, as uh, Corey has mentioned already, we encourage you to submit questions for our panelists as we go along using the chat feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So welcome panel. We uh, want to start by asking each of you, what motivated you to get involved in gender diversity and inclusion work? And Sarah, you've been at this in so many different roles for, for such a while. Uh, would you go first and tell us how you got involved? Sure, absolutely. You know, I think one of the things that we, in doing this work, one of the things that we try to caution people about is to, is to, you know, when you're learning about something new related to diversity and equity or related to a population that you're not familiar with or as familiar with, it's important for us to, to do our own research, to do our own work, to learn more and not always rely on the individuals of a marginalized identity to do all of the education. Um, there are some of us, you know, that sort of for our own sort of, you know, life journeys um, feel as, so I'll speak for myself. I feel as though I have an opportunity to educate about my community, about my culture um, in a way that for me is very rewarding and I appreciate being able to give back to it. However, as you know, a white cisgender woman, and I forgot to define cisgender earlier. So for those of us who where our sex assigned at birth aligns with our gender identity and or our gender expression, cisgender is the term that we often use um, as opposed to sort of like agender, so not identifying with a gender or transgender to change or cross gender. Um, but so as a cisgender woman, um, you know, I, I have the ability to give back and do some education about gender. I often think that, you know, we don't think about our own gender until there's something different about our experience or the experience of someone we care about. And so there have been lots of folks in my life who identify as trans and non-binary, gender queer, lots of other terms we've used over time. And so being able to, to share a little bit of a knowledge because my goal is to make sure that we're creating communities that feel safer, that feel more welcoming, that feel more inclusive, where everyone can experience a sense of belonging. Um, and sometimes questions about gender um, get in the way of people feeling safe and feeling as though they belong in a space. And I want to do whatever I can to change that. And so this is one of the small ways that I can, you know, sort of help care for my community, um, all of my communities. So that's sort of why this work is important to me. Wonderful. Thanks, Sarah. And Erica, what about you? How did you get involved in gender diversity and inclusion work? Yeah, good morning, Ainsley. And I want to thank you for even posing that question because I, to be honest, I hadn't really thought about where that motivation came from until I, I thought about this panel discussion. And, you know, I would say more broadly, um, like issues of social justice and equality have always been very important to me from uh, a very early age. And I've sought out experiences and work where, where I can advance that, where I can advance those efforts um, to help the world around us just be a little bit more inclusive and equitable. But specific to gender and certainly more broadly with the LGBTQ community, um, I learned and saw just through experiences of friends and sort of what Sarah was, was uh, referring to about, I didn't really think about my gender until I saw the effort and the compromise and the hurt that occurs um, for my friends who have had to cover when they weren't able to bring their true self to a work environment or to their family or to the community. Um, but even then, I, I think I didn't know what my role was, like what is my role um, as a cisgendered straight person? I, I suffered, I think a bit from an imposter syndrome and you know, trying to figure out like what I could do and, and what my role would be. Um, I did know that simply having passive accept acceptance wasn't enough for me to be a, cha a change 
a change agent and to be a part of changing hearts and minds that um, that we all have to be a part of this and we all have to be in it together. And so it was in this context that I really understood uh, what allyship is. And, um, and I have sort of a, a hokey analogy in my mind when I think about it. And I think about it like a boat and I think about it like I'm in a boat, I'm out on Casco Bay and I notice that there's another boat out there that's taken on water. And the crew is vigorously, you know, bailing the water out of the boat. And I could just say, well, you know, that's not my boat. It's their boat. And boy, they look busy. Um, they're busy bailing out that water and I don't want to interrupt. Um, or you could go and help them bail out the water because you know that they're tired. Their safety is at risk. And frankly, they're fighting for their survival. And so it's relatively easy for me to join them in their boat and ease the burden of bailing out that boat. So to me, that's allyship. It feels um, at times, if it's felt risky for me to be an ally, to put my pronouns out there, I just imagine the level of risk and vulnerability that others may be feeling. And, um, and I think that uh, for me to take this role and to promote a safer and kinder and more accepting space is, is a relatively easy lift for me. What a great story of what it means to be an ally. And then Quinn, what about you? You've already had such a remarkable career. How did you first uh, come to be involved in gender diversity and inclusion work? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think, uh, when I'm disliking my job, uh, I tend to blame my mother for pushing me down this, this path in life. Uh, she is a strident feminist and was an incredible role model growing up. Um, you know, I, I grew up to stories of her talking about leading protests in the 60s at her high school. It was an all girls high school in New York where they weren't allowed to wear pants. Uh, and, you know, she would tell me, you know, we didn't burn bras because bras were expensive, honey, but uh, she, they burned skirts uh, and, and held sit-ins uh, in, in the high school hallways. And that, that was always kind of a, an aspiration of mine was to get involved in, in some kind of dedicated change work. And, and she always kind of had this phrase that she would tell my, my sibling and I, you know, when you grow up, you always want to be queen, always be queen. Uh, and of course, I think I took that a bit more literally than she intended. <laughs> um, and so when I, I started transitioning, um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago at this point, uh, as, as a, a teenager in rural Maine, uh, I found myself feeling incredibly alone because, you know, even 10 years ago, uh, the world for trans people was drastically different than it is now. And the, the level of not just acceptance, but of even knowing that trans people existed uh, was, was almost non-existent. Uh, and so uh, I found that I had this, this desperate need uh, for community and connection and belonging that I wasn't finding uh, until one day in my senior year of high school, I uh, walked into a support group with Maine Transnet. Uh, you know, it was actually in uh, Payson Smith uh, on the US on Portland campus uh, back then. And I, I had this kind of instantaneous feeling of connection and belonging that I'd never experienced before. And I was completely hooked and I, volunteered with Maine Transnet over a, a number of years and uh, ended up eventually on the board. Uh, and, you know, I was looking for work at the time and I, I had no intention of, of getting into advocacy work or organizing work, but I kind of, as a lot of people do, tripped into it. Um, and, uh, you know, as I got more experienced with that, uh, sort of the, the recognition of trans people was increasing in our society. And right alongside that recognition was uh, this new kind of targeting of our lives and our bodies uh, and this use of people, particularly youth and, and young folks in our community as sort of a political football um, without any regard for um, their intrinsic value as human beings. And it became very clear to me that we needed uh, our own organization, our own advocacy organization. And so, I, I walked into a board meeting one day at Maine Transnet and I said, hey, I think we need an executive director. And uh, if you all let me do that, I'll do it for free for a couple months and figure out how to pay for it. And they said yes, and that was five years ago. And we, we've had a hell of a time, um, it, you know, really becoming at this point, the largest statewide trans organization, uh, trans support organization in the United States at this point, um, and, and really 
doing some incredible community building and ad advocacy work all across Maine. Um, and it's just a, a joy to see uh, so many other people be able to get that connection and belonging and also live in a state uh, that wants them uh, in a way that I don't think is always evident in other parts of our country. Yeah, that's incredible. Thanks for sharing your journeys, um, each of you. And so now we have some individual questions for each of you. Sarah, having been a student and then staff in various capacities at, uh, at the University of Southern Maine, you've seen USM through different lenses and periods of time. What have you noticed about how the understanding of gender has changed during your time at USM? And then how has the institution adapted to that change? Sure. I, I mean, it's a radical, radical difference in so many ways. I mean, this was, you know, when I started off as an undergrad, this was definitely not something that we were talking about. Um, you know, I think even in 1996, when we established the Safe Zone Project and the presentation that I gave earlier is part of that Safe Zone Project training, um, you know, the, the emphasis was absolutely on, you know, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and we were only starting to really understand about the trans members of our communities um, and of our campus. And so there's been a, a significant evolution of that over time. I think one concrete piece that I'll talk about um, is for many, many years, we had been advocating for the opportunity for students to indicate a name other than their legal name in our database. Um, and so uh, we, um, you know, students who were trans or non-binary and, and who went by a name other than their legal name had no way of indicating on, you know, their class rosters uh, what, their, what their true name was. And so, uh, you know, faculty would call off a name that did not align with how a student was presenting themselves. And this was a threat to people's emotional well-being and also physical safety. And so it took a while for, for the technology to sort of catch up to what we wanted. And so now today, students do have the opportunity to indicate a name other than their legal name. Uh, it is technically called the preferred name in our system. And, and we're really trying to, to steer us away from using the word preferred. Um, you know, some people will, will sometimes talk about preferred pronouns or preferred names. It's not a preference. This is the, the these are the pronouns that an individual uses. This is the name that an individual uses. Um, and so we have actually a really, really good name usage policy for students in the University of Maine system. Um, and that's been in place for a few years. Uh, we're continuing to work on that and adjust it as at, to keep up with the understanding that we have about gender, the understanding that we have about the lived experiences of our students. But I think that that's one sort of concrete example of, of how this has evolved over time. Um, we're also right now in the process of um, working on a project to get pronouns and other gender options included in our database um, for, you know, legal reasons, for federal reporting reasons, um, you know, male and female are categories in our database um, that uh, to many feel as though they are immutable and however, they're not always accurate. And so we wanna be able to provide, especially in the state of Maine where individuals can legally change their sex marker to an X on their ID cards. We need other options in our database. And so again, we're, we're trying to, to um, you know, shoehorn the technology into doing what it needs to do. And so that's what we're working on right now. Yeah, I can definitely appreciate that as we are looking, as we deal with similar technology considerations with our alumni database. And um, Erica and Quinn, is there anything that you would add? You've both been at USM in different periods of time. And is there anything that you uh, can reflect on from your experience at USM about how you know, we're proud that USM is one of the most diverse universities, if not the most diverse university in the state based on a number of measures. But that means that also, this is a place where a lot of um, you know cultural change plays out. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what are your what are your observations? Boy, I feel like I went to USM. I mean, literally, it was decades ago, but it was just such a different culture. Conversations about gender it wasn't happening in the world. Um, and, and so uh, to see the agility by which um, 
higher ed, USM in particular, is, is adapting and responding to um, that change, you know, makes me proud. Uh, higher ed isn't always known for its fast pace of change. And, and so I think to see that happening at USM is, is a moment of pride for me. When anything you would add? Yeah, I, I just think, you know, uh, I've been taking classes off and on at USM for probably close to a decade at this point. And, uh, you know, from a, a student experience, uh, the, the, the most significant change to me is I don't have to send an email to my professor uh, hmm. before I start a class to make sure that they're going to treat me appropriately. Um, I don't see my existence debated as a class topic, but I, I do hear trans people incorporated uh, into the curriculum uh, and some of the classes that I take in, in ways that go beyond simply talking about the fact that we exist. Um, and so I, that, that's that been a significant change. I think it, it's it's somewhat within the university community normalized, uh, which is not the way it is in the rest of the world, uh, but it, it's, it's uh, nice to be part of a community where it is. That's great. Um, Erica. Through your role of, as the chair of Friends at Hanford, you were part of the rollout of Hanford's pronoun initiative. Can you tell us about a little bit about that initiative and what were some of the successes and the challenges of that rollout? Yeah, great. Um, so we did. This was um, about a year ago. Uh, we rolled out pronouns as um, as part of a change with our name tags and our retail stores and that went along with adding languages spoken um, and veteran status and i think before i get into the pros the challenges and the successes of doing that i just want to maybe level set um, some important aspects of that which is the culture at hannaford which i think is really important um, as other businesses and companies think about doing this um, you have to understand the culture at your workplace and um, you know, I'm proud to say that at Hannaford, uh, that it's it's a culture that's committed to nurturing safe spaces and meaningful experiences. Um, you know, we sort of think about the workforce, workplace, marketplace, um, and recognizing and celebrating that differences are essential to that culture of belonging. And it's in that culture of belonging that people can bring their whole selves when they when they um, come to work. Um, but also recognizing that, you know, it, 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 certainly this was the right thing to do, um, but it's, it might not be entirely altruistic, you know, right? We're a business. Um, we recognize that people have a choice on where they work and where they shop. And we know that what, what influences people um, is where they feel safe and comfortable and how can we reflect a community um, how can our associates reflect the communities in which we do business? So I think that's an important backdrop because we didn't just decide one day, oh, hey, let's just put pronouns on our uh, name tags. You know, it, it's a part of a cultural norm of demonstrating two important values at Hannaford, which is the value of care and respect. And we recognize that adding pronouns um, is a way to understand and affirm uh, someone's identity. Um, I'll also add that this is voluntary. We are not um, mandating that people put pronouns on their on their name tag or in their email signature, and that's important too. Um, we want people to sort of get to that place uh, when they're comfortable. So doing this has certainly deepened the culture of belonging. I would say that that's certainly a success. Um, we know that uh, when people feel like they belong and they feel welcomed, you know, that turnover is going to reduce people's job performances, increase, and just overall, there's a sense of community and, and value and worth. Um, so I would say, you know, a, another aspect of success was uh, really starting with engaged leaders. So it started at the top and we needed our leaders to understand um, the importance of this and the why, and for them to demonstrate the behavior, um, you know, throughout, uh, before, during, and after the rollout. Um, you know, a challenge in doing this work at Hannaford, we operate in five states, 
We have 184 stores. We have nearly 30,000 associates. It's a very distributed uh, workforce from Aroostook to um, Albany. And so, um, you know, giving people the proper runway to educate and communicate on the why, um, that was a bit challenging. You know, not all of our associates have access to a computer or to email. And so it was a very deliberate cascade of information um, that was reinforced and, you know, uh, didn't just happen during Pride Month. You know, we try to have that fertilized and ongoing. Um, I would say another challenge was or is the fact that this issue has become politicized and understanding how to decouple the two and to uh, recognize that people who are affected by this don't care about the politics that, you know, again, it's the right thing to do. Um, so yeah, I would say those are probably the, the successes and the challenges. I think that we're, like I said, we're about a year out and, and I think the feedback has been really strong um, during this time. That's great to hear. And uh, I know that I've noticed um, just in my shopping experiences at Hannaford that, and it's made a difference on my experience. And I see that in the chat that your Hannaford colleagues are well represented here. Um, <laughs> and then also amongst our, I, I appreciate what you said about how this isn't, uh, you know, purely altruistic, that there's a good business case for this. And we have a number of folks joining us who lead organizations or who are leaders in HR. And, um, and so I would love to hear a little bit more if Sarah and Quinn, if you have anything to chime in about sort of best practices that you've seen, because I'm imagining that there are a lot of people who are wondering, you know, what, what could I do on an organizational level? You know, I think something I really like about Hannaford's practice, and Eric, correct me if this is wrong, but I, I think in, in looking at your name tags, it raised some other questions of, ways that you could be inclusive as a business. And I think, didn't you also add um, languages spoken as an option that could be listed on your name tags? Is that correct? That's correct, Quinn, yes. So I think something that I see a lot uh, when we work with businesses and institutions at Maine Transnet uh, is that frequently the conversation about trans people uh, sort of opens up this whole can of worms of like, how can we be inclusive and getting into that line of thinking and that doing it for trans people is just a great jumping off point for those conversations. But frequently the solutions that are helpful for being welcoming to, to trans and gender diverse folks present opportunities to be welcoming to other people. Uh, and I, I think that that's, uh, that's a great way of getting uh, workplace culture uh, engaged uh, in a practice of inclusivity and, and welcome, uh, which of course is good for, it's good for morale, it's good for retention, it's good for business. Um, but I, I also just think it's, it's uh, you know, most of the things that trans people need to be included, they're really solvable problems um, in ways that I think a lot of problems in our world don't feel. Um, but, you know, making sure someone's called by the right name and pronouns, it's not that complicated to do that. Making sure that they have a comfortable place to use the bathroom, it's not that complicated to do that. It doesn't require these huge changes. Um, and so, you know, I think if you're, you're thinking long term about what do you want your business to be, what do you want the, the culture of your workplace to be, um, starting from a place of, of gender inclusion is just a great first step towards getting there. Um, so that, that's something that I, I, I've seen in a lot of places, and I think Hannaford is a great example of that. Thanks, Quinn. And Sarah, I noticed that you had unmuted too. Yeah, I was, you know, I think, you know, I, I as Quinn mentioned, I mean, I think that this really is sort of like, you know, an, an entryway into, into really sort of establishing more foundational ex inclusion work and inclusion practices. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, things like, you know, on your job application forms, you know, into, you know, ask for people's legal names because that's going to be an important piece, but also ask for, you know, give an opportunity for people to indicate a name other than their legal name that they use. This is an, an important practice not just about gender, but also about culture. Um, you know, there are lots of, I, I've worked with lots of folks who, um, you know, yes, they have a legal first name, but everybody in their lives calls them by their middle name. Sometimes it's a 
it's a family practice, sometimes it's a cultural practice, but that can be a really important piece. Um, and again, the piece about pronouns, yes, you will likely need to know someone's legal sex for a variety of reasons, um, but allowing people to indicate their pronouns as they use them can be really helpful. Um, and then also as you're continuing to sort of evolve your practices, looking at things like, um, you know, dress codes. Are your dress codes gender inclusive? Are they, you know, do you have a dress code that is specific to the women in your in your in your company and one for the men in your company? Is it based on masculinity and femininity? Is there a way to sort of make your your dress code or your uniform inclusive uh, across the board? I think that that's helpful. Um, and then also, quite frankly, looking at things like um, when you're able to offer health insurance. Is that health insurance um, can the trans members of your staff and your employee group access, um, you know, gender affirming health care? Um, and, and is it covered in a way that is actually meaningful? Um, so I think that that's a that that's another next step that can be used. So. That's so, so helpful. And um, and I'm thinking about our practices as as an organization and just I love having a, a, this sort of like checklist of practices to make sure that it, that we're creating the type of values-driven culture that we uh, profess to, to aspire to. Um, so Inslee, Quinn. Ainsley, can oh, yeah. I just jump in Please. on? Yeah, what Erica, what jump back saying. in. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, another, I love that list, Sarah. And I think I, I would also refer HR folks to, um, to HRC's CEI benchmark survey. I think they have a great punch list if that's what you're looking for, for ways to be inclusive in your workplace. That's great. And we'll definitely include that link as one of our resources afterwards. So the uh, so Quinn, in your bio, you state that the root of power and liberation can be found in communities that embrace their diversity and interdependence. So what are some ways that we can support communities in embracing their diversity and inter interdependence? What does that look like? Mm, absolutely. So I think... <sighs> You know, one of the things that I love about LGBTQ work is, um, you know, LGBTQ identities are, are sort of what we talk about as being horizontal identities. Um, these are not things that we inherit from our parents. Um, these are identities that, that sure we're born with them, but that we develop alongside our peers and from finding people outside of our family units. Uh, and what I, I think is special about that is that it means that LGBTQ people are all over the place in our society. Uh, and we, we exist in almost every family, we exist in every community, and we will continue to do so. Um, I would add, even if politicians attempt to make sure that we can't talk about our existence. Um, and, it, you know, I'm thinking back at like the marriage equality campaigns. I think on top of supporting the rights of lesbian and gay folks, I think it helped our country have a really wonderful conversation about understanding that some people love differently, right? Uh, and that, uh, you know, it got us starting from this place of empathy of like, well, I can understand uh, how someone, even if their love looks different than mine, I know what it means to wanna be loved and to have someone to love. Um, hmm. that's, that's affirming to me. And I think that's great. Uh, I think with the trans community though, there's, there's not always the same comparative experience uh, to, to cisgender people's lives that, that gay and lesbian folks have with straight folks. Uh, and on the one hand, I think that presents some challenges because I think our experiences are just a little bit farther removed from the experiences of most of the people we interact with. Um, and at the same time, uh, I think because we show up in every community and because we show up in so many families, uh, there is an opportunity in learning to support trans people uh, as sort of an, an sort of a gateway point in learning to love and understand and empathize with people whose life experiences are dissimilar to your own, are fundamentally different from your own in ways you probably won't ever understand. Uh, and yet we can still understand that we want that other person to be happy, right? To have a good life. Uh, and so, you know, I think our country is having not for the first time in our history, a big conversation about how do we place value on people whose experiences are removed from our own. 
um, that exists with trans people. I think that exists greatly in our conversations around racism in, our, in the country right now. Like, you know, as a white person, I'm never going to understand the experiences of a person of color, but I can still care that they have good lives, right? I can still care that they, they experience the same freedoms as I do, even if their goals in life might be different from my own. Um, and, you know, we have a, a long history of, of not having empathy for that of not having that, that shared investment of people deserve to live lives on their own terms with equal access to choice about that. And I think that the existence of trans people in our own communities and networks is an opportunity for us to think and reflect on that. Um, not just about trans people, but I, I think accepting trans people helps us learn how to be empathetic more broadly. Um, and so uh, again, I think if you're thinking about what do you want the world to look like and how are you able to engage it to be better? Our workplaces are one of the, the, the communities that we spend the most time in. And uh, frankly, our, our, you know, we interact with workplaces even when not working. You know, I, I'm not working when I go to Hanford. I'm not working at USM, um, but those are our workplace communities. Uh, and so, uh, you know, look around, in those spaces that you have leadership in, that you have a chance to start these discussions. And if it's starting with gender inclusion, I think it's that's just, it's an easier place to start. We have less of a history with this than we do with some of our other society's problems. Um, because most people didn't know trans people existed until recently, though we certainly always have. Um, but I, I, I do think if we want a world where everyone can be welcome, where everyone can thrive, despite the fact that we don't all have shared experiences. We have to start talking about that somewhere. We have to start, um, you know, embracing that value somewhere. And I, I think trans inclusion is a great place to start for that. Um, so that that's what I would hope for, um, for main business leaders going forward is that they, they see their role as being, let's get those conversations started in every community, in the places where we have control to do that meaningfully. Wow, that's so beautifully stated. And um, Sarah, Erica, is there anything that you would add? No, no I don't can't. think I can contribute to that at all. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, so uh, so let's move on to some specific questions that people have, have been sending. There have been a couple of questions about names. And I think coming from a place of, you know, people wanting to get things right. And so, so there were a, there was a reference earlier to you know preferred name isn't the best way of talking about you know what someone's true name is, and then a question about you know what about names that I think starting from continuing this conversation about how you know inclusion in one area leads us to be thinking about inclusion in a lot of areas. You know how do we handle um, names that we can't pronounce or that we're not sure of, but we don't want to. Um, be disrespectful. And so, Sarah, knowing that you work with, uh, you know, with such a diverse faculty community, faculty, student, staff community, maybe you could start this one and, and Erica and Quinn, you could chime in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, the pronouncing someone's name correctly is, uh, is, is a foundational thing. It's also a little bit of a minefield, right? Um, I remember growing up and we had a neighbor um, whose mother was from the South and the way that she pronounced my name, um, she always pronounced it Sarah, which I always found very interesting and, and slightly annoying as a child because I didn't understand <laughs> it. As an adult, I embraced it a little bit more. Um, but, you know, but I, I do think that that's, that it's an, it's an important question. It's an important consideration. One of the odd things I actually really like about social media is, um, you know, Facebook has incorporated this little sort of element where you can sort of indicate how to pronounce one's name phonetically. Um, and I think that's interesting. Um, but I think, you know, the, I think one of the questions that came up is, you know, what's the best way to ask someone how to pronounce their name? And I think it's simply, it's to ask. You know, it's like, hey, can you remind me or can you please tell me, you know, how to pronounce your name and then practice it. it goes the same thing with with asking for someone's pronouns, right? You know, you can you can offer your own pronouns and ask for someone else's. Um, and I think it's just it's I think we worry so much about not being polite or being perceived that we're not being polite and and we just we over overthink it. Um, I think that's the thing we do as a culture is we overthink things. Um, 
sometimes we don't think enough, but I think a lot of times we overthink things. And I think just asking, you know, asking somebody, you know, can you please help me pronounce your name? I want to make sure I get it right. Um, and, and practice it and make sure you're getting it right. Once you've asked the same with pronouns, you know, I, I do a pronoun check with people on a regular basis to make sure I'm using the correct pronouns. Um, one of the other things that sometimes you'll see is you'll see some people um, will indicate you know, their pronouns are she and they. Um, and, and it's always a great thing to sort of have a conversation with somebody be like, oh, I noticed that, you know, you use both she and they pronouns, you know, is there one that I should use in certain circumstances? Um, and just having that check-in with, with an individual and, and engaging in that conversation is actually really respectful, but you have to remember how they respond and make sure you're following up. So that's mm -hmm. what I would say. <laughs> that's great. And I noticed that our friend Anila in the chat says, and you can ask again, like that if you if you do forget that you can ask again um, and that that people appreciate the effort. Um, Quinn is, or Erica, is there anything that you would add? I would just add, you know, Sarah and I were talking in the last couple of weeks about some updates USM is actually trying to make to the database around this. And, and we got into this whole discussion, like, well, do we want to say preferred name or do we want to chose a name as the language that we tend to use in the, in the trans hmm. community? And it sparked this really, Again, wonderful conversation about how, oh, well, you know, there are reasons other than, than being trans where someone might want this field. And so if you're, you're thinking about this on forms or in, in databases, we landed on say, well, what preferred or chosen or preferred slash chosen is, is a great way of thinking about this. Um, you know, I, I worked on a, a bill last year uh, that that brought together a, an unexpected coalition. It was sponsored by, by Representative Billy Bob Falkenham, um, who's from down east and who I have absolutely nothing in common with this person. Uh, mm. We are on absolutely opposite ends of the ideological spectrum. Uh, and yet, uh, Billy Bob's not his legal name. And he wanted to be able to run as the name that people knew him as. And so we were able to work together. Um, I don't think we actually ended up passing it into law. But you know, we, we were able to work together on a, you know, we should call people as who, who they're known by, right? Uh, and so I, I think that making this about something practical uh, is a, an easy way to explain it uh, to folks who, who might have an issue with it politically. Um, uh, on another note, I, I just want to share, you know, I, I do think people are really scared uh, mm. and nervous around screwing up um, yeah. with trans people. And that comes from a good place. Like we, we don't want to hurt people. Um, and I, I just want to say it, it's going to happen at some point. I, I guarantee it. Uh, we call it misgendering someone when you call them by the wrong name or the wrong pronoun or the wrong, you know, honorific. Um, and, uh, you know, it happens all the time. I misgender people constantly. Um, you know, admittedly, I, I interact with more trans people than basically anyone else in the state, I think. But, um, you know, uh, being nervous about it doesn't help. Um, mm. And there's a, a graceful way to get through that moment. Um, and that, that's just when you catch yourself doing it, stop talking for a minute. This is a great strategy in life, I think, by the way, is when you're messing something up, or you're putting a foot in your mouth, just shut up for a minute. Um, I don't know why we're so bad at that as a society, but you have the option to stop talking. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, I, I think one sorry is acceptable. You can put out one sorry. Anything more is, is about making yourself feel better. But one mm. sorry is acceptable. Correct yourself and move on. Uh, you know, most trans people, we don't want to have a conversation about it. Uh, and we definitely don't want to be apologized to for 10 minutes every time it happens. Um, but once sorry, correct yourself and move on. And uh, neurologically speaking, that's going to be the best way to, to learn how to use the proper name and pronoun. Uh, and it, you know, in my experience, it, trans people are going to give you some grace. If we can tell that you're trying, we, we usually we're going to give you some grace. Uh, but only if we can tell that you're trying and correcting yourself is how we know that you, you are. Um, so that, that that's all I'd add to that. Yeah, that's great. And, and I love those couple of practical nuggets of preferred or chosen name and, um, and the one sorry rule. And um, the, so Erica, let me ask you our next question from, um, and there were several questions really related to pronouns, but our friend Buddhist chaplain, Ali Smith, who's with us asked, um, how do you address pushback for using pronouns or people who don't want to use pronouns at all? And I imagine you, due to Hannaford's size and diversity of the workplace, that you probably experienced some of this. So, so do you have any experience that's relevant to uh, people who push back on using pronouns? Yeah, well, um, 
I mean, again, I think uh, I'm very fortunate to work in a place that uh, encourages and tolerates a diversity of conversation. And so I think, you know, when we went into this pronoun work, we knew that not everybody would get it. Um, we knew that not everybody, even once we educated, uh, got it or wanted to get it. And I think we just left space for people to not get it. And as long as they're not being disrespectful, um, you know, that's a, a different story. And, and some of my, my colleagues on, on this call can probably, they're, they're in the front lines, you know, dealing with that. But as long as it doesn't cross that line into disrespect of people, um, I think the culture is one where you can have vibrant discussion. Um, but, I, you know, I, I think just connecting back to the why and Quinn did a great job of sort of showing the divergent viewpoints of, of uh, Quinn and, um, I'm sorry, I'm already forgetting the state rep's name or the state senator's name, but those divergent viewpoints, you know, they were still able to find common ground. And so, this is an opportunity for conversation more than anything else. And if the person walks away still not uh, convinced or bought in, then um, then that's where it is. And you just hope that the culture over time um, normalizes for that person. It is a voluntary program for us. And, and, and I think that that has worked well. Um, so we're not requiring anybody and everybody to put pronouns on their name tag or on their email signature. That's great. And, and another question came up that maybe Quinn or Sarah, you might be able to chime in, chime in on um, from uh, Kristen and Aaron who want to know, what do you do? How do you help support someone whose pronouns have changed and that people, maybe colleagues have known someone as she, her, and now they're they, them. And how do you help? Um, how do you help not put the lift on that person to do all of the work? Absolutely. You know, I think first and foremost, we, we make sure that we practice those pronouns um, so that we're using them consistently. And then I always like to check in with people, um, you know, sort of like, hey, I, I noticed that, you know, our colleague or our friend keeps using the wrong pronouns for you. How can I be helpful and supportive? Is it helpful? Does it feel helpful for me to correct them? you know, can I have a conversation with them on your behalf? Um, you know, just sort of asking like, what's the best thing? I, I was on a board a number of years ago with a, a friend of mine who uses they, them pronouns and the board chair kept misgendering them. And so I checked in with my friend. I was like, hey, you know, do you, the next time this happens, do you want me to say something? Do you want me to say something behind the scenes? And for them, you know, they had already had this conversation a number of times and were tired. They were exhausted about having to do it. And so for them, it felt helpful for me to have a side conversation with the chair. Um, and, and, and I would then always have a side conversation with the chair after the fact, if they, if they use the wrong pronouns. Um, but I've also had conversations with people where, you know, they're like, no, no, I, you know, I don't want you to correct people. I don't want you to say anything right now. It just feels like putting too much of a spotlight on me. Um, I, eventually they'll get it and that's okay, right? But I think it's checking in with the individual to see what's the most helpful thing to do. Um, and I also think encouraging the other people around us to share our own pronouns more, more frequently. Again, like put in your email signature, put it on your Zoom name, um, put it on your name tags, uh, you know, any of those places where you can share your pronoun because it normalizes that a little bit more. I know that's just my initial thought. If, if I could just add to that, um, you know, I think when I work with business leaders, they're oftentimes looking for like check boxes of like, this is the best practice and we will do it. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a whole lot of situations and pronouns is, correcting people and pronouns is a great example of this, where there isn't a best practice. Um, there's a what's best for that person. Hmm. Um, and so I think if, if you're trying to gauge, are you handling like an HR situation correctly uh, involving a gender diverse person, uh, the, the question I would be asking yourself is, is the person in question, are, do they have agency uh, in this setting? Um, am I giving them choice about how to handle it? And I think if you're given choice about how to address something, ideally choice that has some specific options, um, you're probably gonna be on good footing. 
And so Quinn, I, I'm going to direct our next question to you. Uh, Terry, maybe some people saw in the, the chat asked some questions related to, to working with minors, to working with children. And if a, and particularly around if a child has a legal name that's different than their preferred or chosen name. But I just wonder if in general, um, Quinn, knowing that uh, that you have, and, and uh, Sarah too, working with students of different ages, if there's anything to share about the complexity of working with, uh, with folks under 18 who have you know, legal identities and then chosen identities. Yeah, uh, absolutely. There, there's a lot of complexity to it. Um, I, I will say, uh, if you work in a public school here in Maine, there are laws that govern how that works. There are regulations and guidance from the Department of Education about how that works. And if you have questions about that, please reach out to us at Maine Transnet. We would be more than happy to provide guidance on it. Um, you know, I, I think it, the places where things go wrong most often when we're working with trans youth is in interaction with parents, um, particularly if maybe the parents don't have access to the same information about a student's identity that you have, or if they're not going to be affirming of that identity or, or already aren't affirming of that identity. Um, and so, you know, I, I think if you are in a position where that's happening, a couple things to think about, uh, which is, first of all, all of the evidence we have on uh, trans children and youth uh, shows us two things. Uh, first of all, they do know who they are. Um, they are not too young to know who they are. Gender identity is formed at a very young age. We trust cis kids to know who they are. We can trust trans kids to know who they are. Uh, and secondly, um, neutrality on gender affirmation doesn't help. Um, the only way to reduce, um, for example, the incredibly high incidence of suicide that we have in our community um, is to affirm people as who they are. And you can't control anything outside of your individual relationship with this young person, but you can control whether or not you affirm them. And you might be able to control whether or not your institution affirms them. Um, and so, you know, you don't have to be neutral on that. Um, you are allowed to affirm their identity even if mom and dad don't like that identity. Um, and then secondly, I, you know, I think agency is another really important concern here. Um, youth in particular are gonna have a better read on their parents than they will about whether or not they're a safe person to talk about their identity with, um, to, dis to even disclose being trans to. Uh, and so I think if you have concerns about, you know, I see that you're going by this name and these pronouns, wanting to wear these clothes when you're at whatever setting you're in the youth with, um, but I don't see that when I see you interacting with your parents. How do you want me to handle that? Um, it's really common for uh, trans youth to, to ask the adults in their life, call me by this when we're, you know, away from my family, but with my family, I want to go by this. Uh, and a conversation is totally acceptable there. And again, trust their instincts, because uh, what we really don't ever want to do is to potentially uh, out a trans kid, because uh, that, that can have some really dire consequences. Um, That's great. Thank you, Quinn. And there have been a, there have been a couple of questions about, uh, one specific about uh, Hannaford, about, you know, what has Hannaford done with the, you know, with public hassling? Like when there are, um, you know, when you're interfacing with the public and our, our national dialogue is um, politicized and polarized around gender expression and identity. But then there, uh, that also ties to another question that is a little bit more broad about what advice do you have about responding to those who may be unenlightened and or combative about, um, around issues around gender and identity? So Erica, let's start with you about your experience with Hannaford and then open it up to, to Sarah and Quinn about what other um, advice and guidance you might offer. So I'll start by saying I, I don't work in the retail environment. Um, it, it's a weakness of, of where I sit in the, in the business. Um, I, I spend a lot of time there as a customer and certainly visit my colleagues there. But um, in terms of the day-to-day, -day, my understanding, um, and again, I, my colleagues who are on the call might uh, have better information than I, but my understanding is that this type of hassling would be treated just like any sort of hassling on any other issue, and it's not tolerated. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, not to pull back the curtain too far here, but I will say that, you know, on a daily basis, we're getting reports of people who, um, for a variety of reasons, have had have been kicked out of the store. We have passed, you know, trespass no trespass orders. The police get involved. Um, you know, there there really is a a no tolerance policy for um, for breaching a safe workplace. Um, you know, I, I guess I would say tangential to this, and this is before we rolled out pronouns. Um, you know, there are questions and concerns about what happens, especially for maybe some of our younger, more junior associates who might get questions from customers. You know, there's that power dynamic between an associate there to serve the public and the public perhaps questioning someone's gender. And, you know, again, my understanding is that those conversations have happened store by store, leader by leader. And, um, you know, in some cases, the associate might feel empowered to push back and answer on their own. In other cases, it might mean a manager or a colleague coming in and offering support. But, um, you know, it's very important that, that our associates and our shoppers, you know, feel safe when they're in that, in that environment. Oh, and I'm seeing. Yeah, I see your hand up from Colin. Yeah, okay, yeah, good. Our, our <laughs> timing in saying you're 100% right. And also, what incredible bravery there is for someone to be themselves in the public eye. Like, it's very moving to me. So, um, Sarah, I noticed that you've just unmuted. What else would you would you say about this issue more broadly? Sure, absolutely. And it, you know, I think one of the things that we are uh, trying to roll out at USM this year um, is. Uh, we are creating a bias response team. And this bias response team is intended to help address issues like this, um, where there may not be a policy violation, but there's a personal violation. And so harassing someone about their gender, about their name, about their pronouns, misgendering someone consistently is an example of that where it might not cross the line into a policy violation. I mean, harassment certainly is, and so harassment gets people in trouble. Um, but but in these sort of these microaggression realms, um, you know, uh, are we're we're looking for informal resolution opportunities, and sometimes a lot of times those take the take the form of education. Um, this is also one of those places where, for me, as a cis woman, um, you know, it. You know, yes, it may be challenging for me to have a difficult conversation with somebody, but it's not a it's not as emotionally difficult as it would be for someone who may be trans identified or non-binary. And so for me, this is this is this is sort of what Erica was talking about earlier. This is the ally work, right? Like if I can take this lift away from somebody, happy to do so any day of the week. Um, and so I think it's, you know, sometimes it's trying to figure out how to have a, a developmental conversation or an educational conversation with somebody. Um, you're probably not going to change their hearts and minds, but maybe you can sort of like create some sort of ease into a more enlightened or more welcoming, supportive realm. So, I don't know, just, just a thought there. I would also, I would add, you don't have to sell them on it um, and you don't have to take responsibility for it. You know, there are two sets of laws um, in the, the state of Maine. We have the Maine Human Rights Act. And then federally in employment, we have Title VII, um, both of which protect from sex and gender discrimination. And uh, main courts and federal courts have both recognized a failure to intervene in these settings. Um, for example, failure to, to intervene when someone's being consistently misgendered is grounds for a discrimination case. And so uh, if you wanna use the lens of like, this is the law and you're opening the company up to liability, sometimes that's more effective. People get, you don't wanna get sued. Um, and that lets you not be the bad guy. Um, I would also just add, again, uh, failure to intervene uh, is not only potentially discrimination, but with trans people, particularly with some of the comments that get made, you know, we frame them as being transphobia, and they are, um, but they're also very frequently sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's increasingly sexual harassment protections and policies are how trans people are winning employment cases. Uh, and so I, I think that is something just worth being aware of is that if you're not proactive about this, you are opening yourself up. 
Um, it's really helpful. And somehow we are already at the, almost at the end of the hour. And, and um, this has been such a rich conversation. So we're going to end this panel with a speed round. Um, and as we had talked about before in preparing for this, we knew that there was going to be so much good information. And whenever people come to a women in leadership event, they often say that they want something practical to take away. And um, like, so that, that we don't have sort of information paralysis. And so our final takeaway speed round question is, what's one thing that people, an action that people can take today or one key takeaway that you want people to remember? And we'll start with, uh, with Erica and then Quinn and then Sarah. So Erica. Okay, well, I, um, I'm going to bring it back to you, which is, you know, be aware of yourself and your own assumptions and what you're bringing when you walk into a room. Um, when you greet a, a Zoom meeting and you say, hey, guys, you know, just think about the, the times in which you bring that, um, that cis normative gender language into a conversation and make assumptions and flip it to being curious and uh, having a wider mindset. That's great. Thanks, Erica. Quinn. Uh, look up the Human Rights Campaign Corporate Equality Index and look at their checklist for what it takes to be uh, a uh, top level employer uh, and see if you line up with it. And if not, there's your list of what to do. Hmm. That's great. Very practical. Thanks, Quinn. And Sarah? Um, I would say always include your pronouns when you introduce yourself to someone, even if the other parties look at you like you have 12 heads. Um, always include them because you're, you're, you're just helping to encourage the, the respect for pronouns as you go along. Hmm. And, and here's your bonus one. If your organization is really struggling with doing this work and wants to learn more, um, reach out and hire an organization like Main Transnet to train your staff, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, give back to the community. Uh, Main Transnet does amazing, amazing work. Support them, hire them, uh, you, you know, and if they are not available, they will make good recommendations as to who can help you out. Great recommendations. And in the Zoom environment, it's easier than ever to use your pronouns when introducing yourself. So, um, the, so once again, I hope that everyone is, all of the panelists are seeing the effusive love in the chat for this session. Um, this has been such a, a helpful and really beautiful panel. So thank you each of you for joining us. And let me now turn it back over to Corey to close us out. Hey, um, I am so proud of our two USM alums on the panel and our future USM alum on the panel. This was an amazing um, group of, of people and I learned so much from the conversation. I love all the vulnerability in the chat with your questions that are brave because sometimes it's hard to ask those questions. And I also loved all of the team support and the um, shout outs um, and the positivity in the conversation in the chat conversation. So I really thank our um, participants for being so wonderful. So um, as a reminder, we will send out two things to you today. We're going to send you all a survey to find out how did you like this um, event? What um, worked for you? What can we do um, differently the next time? Please just take, it's literally 90 seconds um, to give us some feedback so that we can make sure to give you exactly um, what, you're, what you're wanting from these USM Women in Leadership uh, events. The second email that we're going to send you will come in a couple of days and that will be the recording of this um, event if you wanna share it as a resource. And it will also include the resources that Quinn, Sarah, and Erica have shared both in this Zoom and also um, with us separately, like tools for all of you, because I know our women in leadership like tools. So look out for both of those emails. Uh, finally, we've got a couple of um, swag raffles to close us out. Uh, in the past, where is Blair? Blair, where are you? There she is, Blair. Um, so in the past, we've done Husky Snuggle Packs, but we're done with February and the month of couples love. And so now we're doing individual love, loving yourself. So our Husky Snuggle Pack is a blanket for one. And it is a USM uh, Foundation uh, Tumblr. So 
let me read the winner. I know Larissa has sent that. Amy Henshaw, I saw you here and you were the winner of the uh, self-love snuggle pack. And then our second winner, same prize is Sydney Clifton. So congratulations to Amy and Sydney. Um, thank you all so much. I'm gonna close this out by saying thank you to Bangor Savings Bank for being our series sponsor this year. We've had two um, amazing women in leadership events, so helpful, and we love partnering with you. So with that in mind, it is nine o'clock. I'm not going over. Um, Husky love to all of you and have a wonderful, safe week. Um, goodbye. <laughs>